Uh, now I introduce Professor Leopoldo Bernucci, who is Professor of Spanish and Portuguese in the Russell F. and Jean A. Fiedman Chair in Latin American Studies at University of California at Davis. His research interests span colonial and modern Latin American literature from Brazil and Spanish America. He's the editor of the notated edition of Euclides da Cunha, Os Sertões, in Brazil. Let's welcome Professor Bernucci. Good afternoon. I don't mean to starve anybody here, and I don't want to see people falling down on the floor with an empty stomach, so I'll try to synthesize what I had previously prepared so we can get out of here in a timely manner to grab something to eat. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Lauri Sarra and Professor Mariana Bofarini, the main organizers of this event, but also the entire group that worked so hard to make this thing possible. I will also would like to thank the uh, Irish Embassy for supporting this event. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk to so many people who I didn't know and I'm getting to know now and admire their work. The title of my paper already implies something quite obvious. <laughs> the unquestionable relevance of Roger Caseman's life for historians and for all of us who care about human rights and justice in this extraordinarily complex, violent, and also disappointing world in which we live today. I say this because if Roger Caseman were here and now, he would be shocked, sad, and discouraged to know that why slavery, or for that matter, any type of slavery, still exists, including in areas where he tried so hard to eradicate it. He would also feel hopeless, as we do sometimes, thinking about more recent episodes of genocide that replicate the horrors of the 1910th and the Putumayo which he so tirelessly investigated and vividly narrated to us. Thus, it's quite easy to realize why he is essential to the history of human rights fight in Africa and South America, and also to the history of political independence in his own country, Ireland, whose revolutionary campaign inspires all of us who seek freedom. And he was the same revolutionary spirit that ultimately cost his life, a life that we celebrate here today. We all know that Roger Casement, of course, is larger than life. His work in Africa was above and beyond the measure of his foreign service duties in the Amazon he was again grand and surpassed everyone's expectations in terms of his dedication, professionalism, responsibility, and resilience. It is in this geographic area of South America that I will concentrate my remarks on his work and will attempt to explore some ideas on why Caseman is also important to literary fiction in other words, why he matters to our best novelists. Without a doubt, different methods of fictionalizing Caseman's biography have already proved to be essential to the understanding of his intricate and perhaps impenetrable personality. In 2010, the Nobel Prize winner, the Peruvian writer Mario Vargas Llosa, so much mentioned here before, presented us with a fictional biography that, if nothing else, has brought much attention to Caseman's humanitarian work and personal life. Mariana Bolfarini shows us in her PhD dissertation, Between Angels and Demons, Trauma in Fictional Representation, 
defended last year. The variety of solutions different modern and contemporary authors have employed in representing Caseman's biography through theatrical plays, novels, and radio plays. And here we have a list of the works that she analyzed in her dissertation, which I hope will turn into a book soon. Let me make absolutely clear what I would like to do today. I'm not arguing here for the efficacy of fictional representations vis-a-vis -vis historical accounts. As some modern philosophers of history have taught us, the business of fiction writers is different from that of historians. And this difference, in my opinion, does not allow us to make a value judgment and much less a fruitful comparison that ultimately will result in choosing one over the other. But one thing is certain, both history and fiction depend on words to narrate their accounts. If a comparison is not in the best interest of a clear understanding of the role that history and literature play in our lives, why did Aristotle propose a differentiation in his poetics? In it, he remarks that the difference between the historian and the poet is not that between using verse or prose. No, the difference, he continues, is this, that one relates actual events, the other the kinds of things that might occur. Consequently, poetry is more philosophical and more elevated than history since poetry relates more of the universals while history relates particulars. And Professor Gibbons, by the way, he mentioned something around this idea of the particulars and universals in his talk a while ago. Deviating from this rather dichotomous view of the two disciplines, Michel Foucault has claimed, and I quote, that the real is not subject to the possible implying his premise the following question. Is it possible that after all, the reality of history is reduced to only facts and things that have happened? Again, by offering you this reflection on the road of history and literature, my intention is not to present a defense of poetry as the Greek philosopher and many poets and critics did before. Neither is my desire to defend the superiority of history in relation to literature, but rather to reinforce something that I quote from Sir Philip Sidney. Now for the poet, he nothing affirms and therefore never lies. One certainly can use these same notions applied to poetry when one thinks of prose fiction. The manner in which a novel, especially a realistic novel, assimilates the historical record can be misleading. First, it may make readers believe that the novel must, faithful, must be faithful to the historical source from which it borrows. And when it does, the conclusion is that the novel is lying. There is nothing more erroneous than applying the concept of truth or false, truth or lie to something we call fiction. The different ontological nature of fictional texts is in opposite relation to the ontology of history books, where notions such as veracity or truth define and justify the field of historiography. Second, it is also a mistake to criticize realistic or historical novels for being incomplete or for not containing all the historical information that a certain type of reader expects. To demonstrate my point, I would like to offer examples from two novels in which the atrocities committed in the Putumayo are represented. The first novel is The Vortex, La Voragine, published by José Ostasio Rivera in 1924 in Bogotá. And the second is the already mentioned here, The Dream of the Celt, or El Sueño del Celta, by Mario Vargas Llosa. 
I begin by providing you with a fallacious argument for the sake of demonstrating that some readers really believe that a writer must include this or that source in a novel that has already cannibalized a great deal from the historical record. This is the case of a reading by Jennifer French who felt compelled to acknowledge Rivera's refusal to directly name and indict the Peruvian Amazon company in his novel. And I quote, Rivera chose to tell one version of the story over the other, deriving his historical information from sources close to Roger Casement and electing to suppress altogether the British presence in the Putumayo, unquote. I emphasize the phrase close to Roger Fate Casement because that tells me how much research was done in order for this statement to be made. Does close mean similar in this case? And if it, the source actually derives from Casement's report, why not to mention the reports, which is exactly what Rivera does, as we'll see in a moment. In a 1928 draft letter addressed to Henry Ford, but which apparently was never sent to the auto industry magnet, the Colombian writer declares, and I quote, he is addressing this letter again to Henry Ford, who was living in Detroit in those days. It would be good for you, Mr. Ford, to know a bit of the history of the region you are about to occupy, and also that of its neighboring areas, because many of those criminal heroes are still in good health, and will seek jobs at your new colony. And here, of course, is referring to Ford Lundia. You're probably familiar with this enterprise by Ford in 1928. And then in less than a decade, the whole thing collapsed because of fungi that started attacking the plantation of rubber trees in the Tapajó areas. Casement advised the English parliament to interrupt rubber exportation for two years why a robust campaign against those abuses was being organized. This is still in his letter, I'm reading from it. It would be wise to investigate, Mr. Ford, which measures were re recommended for this campaign because the abuses not only expanded in the Putumayo, and this was 1928, but they have also preserved their vitality. In the Blue Book, in the White Paper, or Slavery in Peru, as it's well known, in Truth Magazine, in La Sanción and La Felpa of Iquitos, you will find, Mr. Ford, terrifying documents. And if you read through my novel, entitled La Voragine, forthcoming in an English translation, written in the solitude of those forests, under the impact of those things that I observed, and the still fresh trail of the Putumayo tragedy, you will become aware of this dreadful chronicle whose knowledge could be useful to you. This was the end of the letter. We all know that the British presence in the Putumayo affairs was, of course, at the heart of the Casement's investigation and denunciations. But as such, it was PAC, the Peruvian Amazon company, that Rivera ultimately selected as a target even though British investors were also responsible for making this company develop. Readers of the Vortex do not necessarily, in my opinion, have to know the origins of the investment in the company or specific names of its investors. Let's go back to Aristotle's remarks about the universals and the particulars. Suffice it to say that in another similar fiction, Joseph Conrad does not mention one single time Belgian Congo or Leopold II in his masterpiece. Nevertheless, we as readers of Heart of Darkness are struck by the powerful denunciations of atrocities committed in the Congo. In her critique, French does not account for the fact that fiction has a different burden of proof than history with its true finding methods. Hers is a common refrain by those who read the vortex as a novel, not as a novel, I'm sorry, but as a historical document. Similarly to French misreading of the novel, 
Roberto Simon Crespi claims that, and I quote him, Rivera instead has detailed information on Britain's involvement. Sorry, here my fingers are too heavy. British uh, involvement in the exploitative rubber industry and yet refuses to introduce it into his novel. While these two critiques miss in their treatment of the vortex as a novel that fictionalizes historical texts is what Henry James called the intensity of illusion. Wayne Booth, quoting James, argued that it is precisely this illusion, most often the illusion of experiencing life as seen by a fine mind subject to realistic human limitations, which it makes all the difference in discerning fiction from history. Rivera was aware that the exigencies of any good realistic novel as a genre dictate subtle and suggestive solutions. They also require that while the author must maintain himself close to the historical record, he must also keep a certain distance between the novel and its sources. This is a productive tension that has profound implications in the overall artistic accomplishment of fictional texts, texts that usually can accommodate beauty and horror represented simultaneously or separately by a poetic or connotative language. Even if Rivera did not directly attack the Putumayo slavery regime and held the British accountable for, for it as his critics wanted to, he certainly provoked a strong reaction by the Peruvian Amazon company. Alfredo Villamil Fajardo, the Colombian consul in Iquitos, reviews this reaction in his 1924 declaration. And I quote Fajardo's here, a statement. Another method that the Putumayo lords have used to spread empty in Iquitos is the ridiculous accusations that I have provided Mr. Jose Eustacio Rivera, with whom I maintain no relationship, with useful information for him to revive infamous scenes in the vortex, whose background is the Putumayo, and to represent it in it Julio Arana and his Colombian partner, Juan Vega, or also when well known as Juan Chito Vega. With Arana's machinations and the help received from Colombia's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Vega was nominated Colombian consul in Iquitos during 1904 and 3. And I was mailed a copy of Mr. Rivera's exemplary work from Iquitos, a copy that has never reached my hands, but it is serving as my en enemy's weapon. Both the Arana and Vega families, aligned with the most influential families in Iquitos, are using this book to falsely accuse me of espionage and bad faith. So we can see here one very early example how this novel had a a significant impact, at least local impact, in Iquitos and in the Arana's um, web that was formed by families and cronies. cronies. Furious at the accusations of crimes committed by the PAC in the Putumayo and name references of Arana and his associates found in the novel, the Arana and Vega families began a defamatory campaign against Colombian consul Villamil Fajardo in 1924 in the very same place, Iquitos. In his novel, Rivera also lambasts Fidia Mil Fajardo's predecessor, former Colombian consul Juan Bautista Vega, who was also J.C. Arana's business partner when he occupied the Colombian consul office in Iquitos. There was no doubt in Rivera's mind that Vega was a traitor to his country and the vortex was meant to be more than an inconvenience. Indeed, it became another serious problem for the Arana company. While the brave Saldaya Roca was undoubtedly the first one to collect and publish testimonies by the Putumayo victims, therefore disseminating them regionally in Iquitos, Lima, and sometimes Manaus, it was Caseman who interpreted them for us by offering rational organized, analytical, and coherent narratives of the atrocities. 
And it was his imprint characterized by a logical reasoning, a remarkable style, a cry of wrath, and an honest tone shown in his prose that in those days is struck and today continues to strike a chord with its readers. Caseman's brilliant mind appears constantly in his writing, in the way he uses analogy, connects the dots, documents in minute details, detail the methods of torture, emphasize the misery of the Amazon Indians, synthesizes stories, and unmasks the perpetrators. His genius was also to produce, even under the most challenging circumstances, an elegant prose that commands respect and invite us to read more of his stories, in which one finds that unique trademark of his, even in the, even in the text of his precursors. And here I'm playing with an acronym that also uh, Luke mentioned here before. As Jorge Luis Borges has suggested in his reading of Franz Kafka's stories, Reading Casement also make us aware of and help us recognize his voice, style, and impeccable judgment in the text of other writers prior to him. Similarly, the impact of what we read by other writers on us becomes only possible thanks to him. Without Casement, that very same impact would not exist. Let us take, for example, the case of Euclides da Cunha, who in his own right antecedes Casement's denunciations of crimes committed in rubber extraction areas of the Amazon by at least three years. And by the way, Clis da Cunha also uh, antecedes uh, Sardinha Roca's denunciation, which began in 1907 and went all the way through 1908. Contrary to the reaction that readers of rebellion in the backlands, this is Euclides da Cunha, of course, a major uh, work, uh, known as Os Sertões for us in Brazil. So contrary to the reaction that readers of Rebellion in the Backlands had, Euclides' powerful condemnation of torture, human traffic, and massive murder in rubber states unfortunately had a no impact on his audience or government officials at his time. His formidable article published in the widely read newspaper in Rio de Janeiro, Jornal do Comércio, on February 2nd, 1907, titled Os Caucheros, he used the Spanish word for rubber gatherers, seringueiros in Portuguese, and later including his book, A Margem da História, or On the Margin of History, had no significant repercussion inside or outside of Brazil. Already accustomed to reading his monumental Os Sertões, or Rebellion in the Backlands, Euclides' readers must have not taken him seriously or took his articles, or his article as another piece of literature of his. Even though the Caucheros and other later texts where he denounced the criminal syndicate rooted in Amazonia have not enjoyed a well-informed audience that could make justice to his human rights contribution and compelling prose. And here we have for you to just take a, a look at uh, the two novels, uh, the, the very novel, the, the one novel and then Roger Casement's um, statement uh, drawn from the Amazonian Journal and Euclides Acuna in Os Calcheros. And here they're, of course, talking about the commodization of a uh, of human beings treating as Euclides was uh, stunned uh, to, uh, to hear that, uh, that a woman was being given as a, as a gift to, uh, to a man. Uh, Caseman has seen that picture uh, again, and then Mario Vargas Llosa um, appropriates of this very same information that is so so impacting uh, in, his, in his novel. Without the uh, impact of Caseman's remarks, and I here I go back to that reversal, uh, reverse way of, of, of reading uh, Caseman and his uh, precursors. 
Without the impact of Casement's remarks, Euclid's observation, for instance, on how bodies were commoditized, especially female bodies, would continue to pass unnoticed again for decades to come. It is regrettable that on a, an observation such as this one did not catch the eye of the vast majority of Euclid's readers. Fortunately, what these two Latin American novelists did was not merely coincidental, since both Rivera and Vargas Llosa deliberately chose to reenact Caseman stories, and we'll see more examples now coming, more than a literary imitation of an utterance or a scene on human traffic narrated in Caseman's diaries, the two novelists understood the real importance of exposing his slavery of its worst kind in Amazonia. The next comparison I would like to present to you is between texts by Caseman and Rivera, which meet at the intersection of another tragedy in the Amazonian Indian's life. Here, Roger Caseman has captured the most profound state of humiliation, loss of dignity, and decadence of the Indians of, uh, of that region. Caseman's remarks, as one can see, resorts to a sad paradox where the Indians here are um, being again um, treated as, a, uh, as truly objects, uh, being objectified, and, and you can see again how this trading or treatment of human beings for objects that you uh, are familiar to the to the media rifles or uh, even the, the sausages the rubber uh, balls and so far and here is what uh, I would like to uh, to emphasize um, Caseman's remarks then um, as we can see here resorts to this sad paradox where the Indians are dancing and grieving at the same at the same time um, here, um, if we read it, Roger Caseman, you will you get the feeling all native joy died in these woods when these half caves imposed themselves upon the primitive people, and in place of occasional occasional raid and in, in tribal fight gave them the bullet, the lash, the sickle, the chain gang, and death by hunger, death by blows, death of twenty forms of organized murder. He is preparing us for a uh, much more dramatic scene that you will see um, right here, uh, where paradoxically or ironically, we have dance mixed with death or something similar to that. Um, well, the slide we saw before is the result of a long process of stripping the Indians of their empowered life and replacing it with a culture of intimidation terror and an organized crime system that overpowers the Indians with this arsenal of torture instruments and firearms. Consequently, when Indians seem to dance, this is the slide we're seeing now, as part of their rituals, there is gloomness, an atmosphere of mourning, and a macabre dance performance. So you can see here in words that are almost uh, uh, imitated by uh, Rivera, in that case, the the point that I that I was making. Um, I have just mentioned that when the Indians are overpowered by firearms, their patrones possess easy control of them. This is another motif that appears in narratives where the imbalance between Winchesters and bows and arrows become quite evident. This is a real motif that uh, runs through uh, these narratives, how one Winchester uh, can decimate um, more than 100 Indians. And Euclid de Cunha has a very powerful section in Os Caucheros uh, where he uh, brings to memory Fitzcarraldo's uh, aggressive incursions in the Amazonia and how he uh, threatens the Indian to even uh, give up or will destroy it. And of course, he does the latter. 
and we with just a few uh, firearms, they killed more than 100 Indians in seconds. I have just mentioned that when the Indians are uh, overpower them by firearms, these patrones uh, can easily take care of them. It's a disproportionate difference in terms of combat that both Euclides da Cunha and Roger Caseman noticed by offering us a historical perspective that takes us back to the raids, conquest, or correrias, as they were also known, by Francisco Pizarro in the 16th century. So you can see Euclides da Cunha bringing uh, to memory again a similar method that Pizarro used to do, and then in Roger Caseman, we see the same sort of metaphor. Of the different methods of torture and assassination utilized by members of the Peruvian Amazon Company, none was more common than putting the Indians on, stock, on stocks, and none was more brutal than killing a baby while its mother was watching. This is another very impressive scene that we see in, uh, mentioned in Caseman's diaries, and then it's replayed again in Jose Eustacio Rivera. In Matacano, seeing him covered with blisters and sores caused by the heat and insects, declared was a case of smallpox. Grabbing the babe by the legs, he twirled to it in the air and tossed it in the river. And the two of them, both, Case member Vera cried out loud against one of the most grotesque violations of human rights, namely crimes against humanities. And here, I think, is where the voice of Caseman appears more um, emphasized. These men have never been punished for the most awful offenses against humanity. The thing we find here is carrion, pestilence, a crime against humanity. The crimes committed were atrocious and a disgrace to humanity. And on the other hand, these crimes, which are a shame to the human species, should be known all over the world so that governments will take steps to stop them. If we take a close look at these three writers, careers individually, it becomes clear that Euclides da Cunha, José Eustacio Rivera, and Mario Vargas Llosa regarded their literature as part of their literary mission. Writing for them is first and foremost a civic and moral obligation. Central to their literary project is a necessity to advance their fight for the improvement and protection of humankind. It is also difficult to think of three authors in our area who have spent more time than they have working diligently and authentically toward the preservation of memory through their compelling, sincerely, inspiringly, and artistically crafted narratives. And Roger Caseman had much to do with that. Indeed, the ghost of Roger Caseman is beating on the door. Thank you. So now we open uh, uh, space for questions. Okay, Professor Carlos. Thank you. I, I wanted to make a comment this very interesting uh, address by Professor Leopoldo Bernucci. I, 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 I think it, the thesis works out very well. And casement is a sort of uh, sound box, both for Rivera and for Vargas Llosa, Euclides da Cunha, perhaps, even other authors, Colombian, Peruvian as well. But I think there's a basic, I would think there's a basic difference. I, I, what, one of the things that I find more interesting about Rivera is that in his very original approach to literature, with, which was in a sense very 
uh, he was, in a sense, very autodidactical. He really tried to get into the skin of a cauchero, of a rubber gatherer. His is not an, an indigenous novel, as uh, other novels would try to portray the Indians from the Indians' point of view. There's even a very interesting novel from 1924, uh, contemporary to this, which mentions rubber gathering. It was called In the Heart of the Virgin Jungle, El Corazón de la Selva Virgen by Quiñones. It was published in Paris, and it's not very well known. But Rivera does a very interesting thing, is that he, 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 he blends with the psyche of the rubber gatherer. So he's, do, he's doing exactly an opposite of what Casement is doing in a way. Casement is trying to see through the eyes of another race, in a sense. And Rivera is also making a... Uh, He's making a cry, he's denouncing the crimes, but he is showing them from the inside of the rubber gatherers. He tries to explore the logic of crime, not just making the, uh, a sort of um, objective denunciation, but a very subjective one. And, and, and that's one of the, uh, what I think it's uh, the great power of the novel, because it really is a journey into madness that even doesn't stop where Conrad conveniently stops. Conrad has this Western obsession to be the only survivor. Marlowe gets out. He gets very, he, ha, he, ha, he gets sick and he's very much traumatized by, by what he sees, but then he still gets out like Ishmael in, in, in Moby Dick or like Dante perhaps. No, Rivera eh, 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 or Arturo Cova, the, the main character, he, he really, he is plunging himself so much into the jungle that he disappears in it, rather like Edgar Allan Poe's eh, Arthur Gorton Bean, which I, I think are the only two examples in which the West recognizes its defeat against the jungle. So it's, it's, it's a heart that is really possessed by the jungle, and that, I would say, would make a big difference they are object, they denounce the crimes. They both think that they are a, a shame to human species, as it, as it says there. But Rivera really did try to understand the, in inverted quotes, the criminal. And I think that's one of the, the, uh, of the current themes that uh, very much shock us. We are very, we tend to accuse Arana and his associates from really trying to avoid understanding their circumstances. And understanding their circumstances is not to apologize them, but to try to understand it from the inside point of view. And Rivera, I think, just tried to, did, to do that. On the other thing, I, I, I understand the point around Vargas Llosa, but I am... Uh, one of my problems with Vargas Llosa's novel is that, as well as he shows information, he hits information concerning Peru. And I think that's very problematic because Vargas Llosa is related physically, familiar. He has family, distant fam family in Iquitos that were perpetrators of the crimes. And he altered the names of some of the responsibles in Iquitos. So uh, I think that all these texts show as much as obviously hide things. Uh, and and I, well, I want just to polemize about it. Okay, thank you for your comments, Carlos. I will start by uh, responding to your second uh, remark. Uh, look, I think if, if you start thinking about what it, the novel is lacking, again, I'll, I'll go back to the point that I made during the lecture that a novel does not have any obligation to contain everything. And we can feel angry and raise our hands and call names, uh, but there is a certain freedom that uh, the novelist has that a historian perhaps does not enjoy, in my opinion. 
And it's a big difference. Um, yes, he was Peruvian. Yes, he knows about Peru. Yes, he has done his homework very well. Yes, he has defended the Indians as no one's in a beautiful novel that you're familiar with, La Casa Verde, 1966, which is my favorite novel, by the way. And I agree with you, this is not the most accomplished novel, in my opinion. He is a terrific narrator. I continue to enjoy him, but it's not the greatest book that he has ever produced. Uh, when you look at his production in general, he is a very, uh, very conscientious uh, writer. He wants to do something more than write novels, and you can tell that. So just for that, I think we need to give him some credit and give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, with respect to the first one, um, yes, La, La Voragine, it became one of my favorite novels because it's so rich and so poorly read, unfortunately. And uh, I talked to people in Colombia, my students in the United States, very bright students, who sometimes cannot grasp everything because it's a totalizing type of novel. He wants to encompass everything. It almost gives you that sense of dizziness that, you're, that one feels when you are overwhelmed by the amount of materials and voices. And I'll like to stress this, the voices. Um, yes, he does, um, in comparison to Caseman, Caseman had probably two voices, and he tried very hard to have the other voice through him, the voice of the Indians. And sometimes you can see that that gaze is almost coming through him. But I think the circumstances were different. He was also there in a mission, surrounded by people who were part of his um, you know, cohort, social cohort. He was there with the commission. He was not there alone. Rivera had almost one year to meditate in the jungle, in the forest, as you know, in 1923 when he traveled. So did Euclides da Cunha. They were there. Of course, they were part of a commission too, but they were feeling as loners. One day, there is a, an anecdote that you probably know that. Uh, he got lost, and he was lost for three days. Everybody was concerned about it. See, he wanted to do his own thing, and then got lost. Then he comes back, and he was, uh, he had the task to interview people, people who were very much uh, affected by what had gone, what had happened 10 years ago. Uh, he talks about Miguel Pesil, who is a, was a very strange character. He was a, a baron, small baron, uh, rubber baron, of the uh, Laranja or Naranjal area on the Rio Negro. And, uh, and Pesil what was doing, he was just selling Colombians, so human traffic. And he interviews each one of those people who were running away or had been victimized, and etc. So the experience of, uh, um, of Rivera, I think it was different, not only because of the time span, but the intensity, and because he, I think he had more freedom to do what he had to do. He was not abiding by any kind of rules. Caseman couldn't talk because probably he would not have understood what the Indians were saying or some um, natives were saying. But he only could investigate, as we know, the Barbadians because they were British uh, nationals. And so he was not, by, by protocol, he was not allowed to have any kind of interrogatory with the victims. Uh, that was not Rivera's uh, case or Euclides de Cunha's case. So um, going back to the novel again, to the vortex of La Voragine, the, there are so many voices there that I think he was able to capture in that kind of a polyphonic, using Mikhail, Mikhail Bakhtin's um, uh, terminology, many voices that contradict each other, but also enrich our understanding of what was going on that are absent in a sort of historical 
account, if we can call the diaries a historic account, uh, such as the ones written by Casement. And I could go on and on, but um, uh, we'll stop okay, here. So let's thank our speakers again.